Hello, and welcome to BigBookCGK.com. My name is Tosi, and I'm reading The Call of the Wild by Jack London, Chapter 5, The Toil of Trace and Trail. Thirty days from the time it left Dawson, the salt water mill with Buck and his mate at the fore arrived at Skage. They were in a wretched state, worn out and worn down. Buck's 140 pounds had dwindled to 115. The rest of his mates, though lighter dogs, had relatively lost more weight than he. Pike, the malingerer, who in his lifetime of deceit had often successfully feigned a hurt leg, was now limping in earnest. Son Lex was limping, and Dub was suffering from a wrenched shoulder blade. They were all terribly foot sore. No spring or rebound was left in them. Their feet fell heavily on the trail, jarring their bodies and doubling the fatigue of a day's travel. There was nothing the matter with them except that they were dead tired. It was not the dead tiredness that comes through brief and excessive effort, from which recovery is a matter of hours, but it was the dead tiredness that comes through the slow and prolonged strength drainage of months of toil. There was no power of recuperation left, no reserve strength to call upon. It had been all used, the last least bit of it. Every muscle, every fiber, every cell was tired, dead tired. And there was reason for it. In less than five months, they had traveled 2,500 miles, during the last 1,800 of which they had had but five days rest. When they arrived at Skage, they were apparently on their last legs. They could barely keep the traces taut, and on the downgrades, just managed to keep out of the way of the sled. Mush on, poor sore feet, the driver encouraged them as they totted down the main street of Skage. This is the luck. Then we get one long rest, eh? For sure, one bully long rest. The drivers confidently expected a long stopover. Themselves, they had covered 1,200 miles with two days rest, and in the nature of reason and common justice, they deserved an interval of loafing. But so many were the men who had rushed into the Klondike, and so many were the sweethearts, wives, and kin that had not rushed in, that the congested mail was taken on alpine proportions. Also, there were official orders. Fresh batches of Hudson Bay dogs were to take the places of those worthless for the trail. The worthless ones were to be got rid of. And, since dogs count for little against dollars, they were to be sold. Three days passed by, by which time Buck and his mates found how really tired and weak they were. Then, on the morning of the fourth day, two men from the States came along and bought them, harness and all, for a song. The men addressed each other as Hal and Charles. Charles was a middle-aged, lightish-coloured man with weak and watery eyes and a moustache that twisted fiercely and vigorously up, giving the lie to the limply, drooping lip it concealed. Hal was a youngster of 19 or 20 with a big Colt revolver and a hunting knife strapped about him on a belt that fairly bristled with cartridges. This belt was the most salient thing about him. It advertised his callowness, a callowness, sheer and unutterable. Both men were manifestly out of place, and why such as they should adventure the North is part of the mystery of sin that passes understanding. But her the chaffering saw the money pass between the man and the government agent, and knew that the Scotch half-breed and the mail train drivers were passing out of his life on the heels of Perrault and Francois and the others who had gone before. When driven with his mates to the new owner's camp, Buck saw a slipshod and slovenly affair, tent half-stretched, dishes unwashed, everything in disorder. Also, he saw a woman, 
Mercedes, the men called her. She was Charles' wife and Hal's sister. A nice family party. Thank you very much for watching. You've been listening to Call of the Wild by Jack London. My name is Tosi and this is BigBookCTK.com. Thank you very much and bye for now.